It's now my distinct honor to introduce our keynote speaker this morning, Mr. Eric Schinninger. Eric is a senior fellow and thought leader on digital leadership with the International Center for Leadership in Education. He also maintains a presence as a practitioner by serving as the K through 12 Director of Technology and Innovation in the Spotswood School District. Prior to this, he was the award-winning principal at New Milford High School. Under his leadership, his school became a globally recognized model for innovative practices. Eric oversaw the successful implementation of several sustainable change initiatives that radically transformed the learning culture at his school while increasing achievement. Eric's main focus is the use of social media and web 2.0 technology as tools to facilitate student learning, improve communications with stakeholders, enhance public relations, create a positive brand presence, discover opportunity, transform learning spaces, and help educators grow professionally. And I can't think of a more fitting set of things to talk about during our session this morning. And so please join me in welcoming Eric Schinninger to the stage. All right, good morning, everybody. Good morning. Nice, all right, I gotta set my timer here because I'm not very good with time. All right, there we go. So it'll buzz right before, because I know I will get too caught up and then I'll have to go through all my slides really quickly. But I do want to tell you, I have a digital handout at the end of my keynote. So all of my notes, I mean, there's so much there. So if I go through some slides quick, the images are on the handout. So you can either scan the code or you can write the case sensitive link down. It's entirely up to you. But I promise you, I have that takeaway when we're done. I also have the hashtag throughout my slides. So hopefully we'll be tweeting a great deal. And uh, let's go. All right, so when we talk about education, it really is you are influencing the future of our country. And education really is about preparing those kids for today. And we think about all these great things that are going on today in education. And some of those great things, it's a little daunting because of the evolution of technology, but education is the future for all of our kids. And when we look at our kids, our learners, it's not that they're learning differently, but the environment in which they're growing up is dramatically different. Students today are wired differently, and they are so engaged, they find so much meaning outside of school. And if you have young learners of your own, you will be able to relate to this next slide. Because what is that game that many of our kids are playing outside of school today? Minecraft. Minecraft. And if you don't know what Minecraft is, it's okay. It's like Legos on steroids. And when you look at Minecraft and what kids can do, they can do virtually anything. And that's the beauty of Minecraft. Endless possibilities, no rules. Students are collaborating, communicating, solving problems, thinking critically. But most important, they're creating a product that has value. And they're doing it together. And they're doing it not for a grade, not for a pat on the back. They're doing it because it's relevant, it's fun, and it's meaningful. My young I have two young learners at home. I've watched my son create these amazing roller coasters in Minecraft. I have no idea how he does it. But when I sit there and I watch, you can honestly see that these students are employing critical thinking and problem solving skills to create this world that exists because they're setting all these rules. And when you think about not just the Minecraft generation, not just our digital learners that you're trusted with educating, think about how technology is not just evolving at such a fast pace, but how it is impacting our students in more ways than we actually know. We live in a world fueled by technology and invention. We are shaped by what we learn, touch, and see. We start with dreams. I want to be a pro volleyball player. I fashion design. A doctor. Designing machines. I want to be a teacher in the north. That when given the proper tools, manifest themselves in the real world through skill building and creativity. Um, robotics is a very interesting field because it combines engineering and programming. And both of those skills can be very useful in life because our society as a whole is moving towards a more technology-oriented world. Programming teaches you a lot about creativity, ingenuity, and problem solving. You have to be able to think outside the box in order to solve the problems that arise when you're programming something. My name 
name is Chris Johnson and I teach photography. Uh, I'm lucky enough to have a small amount of DSLR cameras for this class. We also have some limited uh, software for our computers. We have a great studio that has great lighting. The students are able to create things that would not be possible with paper and pencil. So technology has really provided a great venue of creativity for our students at Cypress Library. From seeing at a microscopic level the cells and DNA that make up life itself, to seeing some of the greatest monuments that make up the world we live in, at the click of a button, knowledge, ideas, and creations of all languages are able to be instantly shared in this vast interconnected web of information we like to call the internet. So maybe one day we could create something just as revolutionary, but through this new eye we also see poverty corruption and struggle, wounds in which we must mend as global citizens of this world. Technology does not only shape the way we see this world, it shapes the way we see people. We see the beauty that exists in everyone, equally. Let the classroom be our drawing board and social media our stage. Ask your school how they will use technology to lead education to the future. My name is Caleb Briette, and this is our time to become the thinkers, builders, and creators of our generation. We are the 21st century. And as always, stay curious. So we need to prepare kids for the future and understand that the world is changing and our kids expect different and they expect better. And when we think about how technology has impacted our learners, we need to think about how will we engage students as digital learners in the content and process of learning. And we have to be honest with ourselves. When we look at schools today across the country, we need to ask, how are we doing? And I have two reflective questions that are not really negative, but really to get us thinking about how our districts and how our schools are meeting these challenges to meet the needs of our kids. Because honestly, many students don't like going to school. And we found this out a few years ago when we asked our kids what they thought about coming to our school. And when they were honest with us, we had to put our pride and egos aside because they told us that we were failing them, that we were not meeting their needs. So my questions are, would you want to be a student in your own child's classroom? Not for an hour, not for a day, all year long. And more importantly, would you want to be a student in the classroom of your colleagues? the colleagues that you work with? Would you want to be a student in that classroom all day, all year long? These are tough questions that once we finally got the guts to address as a school, we began to rewrite the script because our school traditionally worked better for the adults than it did our kids. And we had to focus on how do we create a school that works better for our kids so that they see the value and the relevancy in coming to school. Our job, your job, has become exponentially harder as teachers, as leaders, because the real world outside of school is much more relevant and engaging to our kids. So how do we fix that? So we have to look at the structure and function. We can't keep preparing kids for a world that no longer exists. Change is needed. And hopefully I'm going to walk through with some practical ways of how you can easily implement those changes. But we have to ask ourselves, is school relevant? Is the structure and function changing to prepare kids for this dynamic world? Are we preparing kids for jobs that don't even exist yet? We have to fo stop focusing on the control, the compliance, and all the rules that in life we don't like as adults. We need to figure out how can we lessen that for our kids? And there's all these amazing qualities. Think about your classes, all these qualities that are exemplified in your work that are not measured by all these standardized tests. The standardization movement has squashed creativity. And then think about the focus on all these things that are so important in every single job that you see in your classrooms every day, but that are not measured. How do we get to the point where students aren't just and you as teachers and as schools, we aren't just reduced to a number, but we really are preparing kids for, for these vital skills that are going to help them be productive members of society. And then there's technology. Still, in many schools, when I travel the country, devices are still blocked 
and banned. Students aren't allowed to use real world tools to do real world work. This is 2015. How do we get past the stigma and the fear that schools have about devices? Because quite honestly, <laughs> think about it. I'll be honest, kids are probably excited when they come to your classes, but when they go to the other ones, they're, they're bored out of their minds. I look at my own two children. My son is in fourth grade, my daughter's in second grade. In New York City, we live in Staten Island, they hate going to school. Every day's a battle. How do we change this? Because ultimately what's happened is school has become this sterilized environment for our kids. It's become sterilized because of the rules, the conformity, the compliance, the lack of creativity. How do we change this to get kids motivated and excited about their learning? It's not just kids that are frustrated, it's also teachers, it's also administrators. Frustration, boredom, lack of direction, guess what? It's time to do something better. And you all can help drive that change that's needed in our schools. But ultimately, what we learned, what I learned a few years ago, if education is good for one thing and good for one thing only, it's good for making excuses not to move forward. We have so many challenges, yes, but those challenges can't morph into excuses. If something's valuable to you, you will find a way. And it's not the talk, the rhetoric, the opinions that are going to change schools in the way that we need them. It's the example that you set. Example does change minds. It changes behaviors. And when you think about the example that you can set in your classrooms, remember this, leadership. Leadership is not about position. It is about action. Everyone has the capacity to lead, but leadership is a choice. You can choose to be a leader. The most powerful leaders in my school, and you'll see, I'll talk about a few of them, were not the people with titles. It wasn't me, it wasn't my superintendent, it was my teachers and my kids, because we empowered them to be the change. Make no mistake about it, teachers are the ones that are working with kids each and every day. Not the leaders. Leaders' job is to remove those excuses so that you can take those risks, you can be innovative, and you can inspire students. The three hardest things we had to do as a school to create a school that worked better for our kids, number one, we had to give up a certain amount of control. This was so hard because if you don't know my story, I was a principal that ran around the school taking devices from kids. I made lives miserable for my students. I didn't believe in any of this. This was hard. And because I didn't get it, my teachers weren't allowed to get it. We had to give up control. We had to actually start trusting our kids. If you want kids to use real world tools to do real world work, you gotta trust them. There's this inherent fear that they might do something wrong. If we wanna empower them to take ownership of the learning, we gotta trust them. And guess what? It's not about the adults. It's about our students' learning. So who owns the learning? In your classroom, in your school, in your district. It's gotta be the kids. And what that comes down to is less us, more them. I'm gonna talk about five specific areas where we can empower those kids to take more ownership of their learning and create that school that they find value in. And when you think about schools that work for kids, yeah, I'm gonna talk a little bit about technology, but it's not about the technology. It's about teaching, learning, and leadership and how the digital aspect supports the work that you're already doing. But how do we integrate technology with purpose? How do we unleash the power inherent in mobile devices? How do we redefine where our students learn? When our students learn? How do we focus on personalized, individualized, and differentiated, differentiated opportunities to meet the needs of all kids? And probably the hardest thing that we had to do as a school, we had to look at the way we graded our kids. Because our kids and us, we were more focused on the grades than we were actual learning. So let's look at the purposeful integration of technology. Technology, make no mistake about it, when implemented with purpose, technology can be transformational. Recording, Lachlan. First hearing, First hearing aid. aid. With Sam. Hello, darling. Oh, hello, Lachlan. Here we go. Well, hello. Oh, darling. Oh, darling. Oh. Oh. You're watching baby yes. Lassen hearing for the first time. Hi. Oh, Hi. Hello. 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 Hello.
Did I tell you oh, it's not yeah, so I bad when you see the results? I did. He's smiling, oh, sweetheart. Isn't that so lovely? <laughs> so if technology can transform a baby's life, make it better for him, imagine what it can do for our students in terms of learning. But there are pitfalls that we have to avoid because we have all these free tools, all these free tools that are being used in society, but here's the deal, they are just tools. They are not a learning outcome. So when we think about, first, why do we want to integrate technology? It's about supporting and enhancing what's already going on in our classrooms. And you look at all these benefits of how technology can support and enhance the work that your kids are doing in your classes, whether it be increasing collaboration, innovating how we assess students, provide them the valuable feedback that they need, it enables learning about information and research like never before. We can now transform time frames around learning, not just in our classroom with our kids, but we can extend learning well beyond the school day. And most importantly, we can give our students more of an ownership over their learning. They're growing up in this technology-driven world. They might know how to use technology, but they don't know how to use the technology to support their own learning. That's where all of you come in. And we ultimately, we owe it to our students because things have changed. Do you recognize me? Very soon I will be your student. But I will not always sit in your classroom. I will not take out a pencil or open a textbook. You grew up with books. I read from a laptop, an iPad, a smartphone. I use a keyboard more than a pen. I'm a digital native, an active learner. Why carry just a textbook when my iPad connects me to the world? I want to know things all the time, and right away. Maybe the best price for cool shoes, or where to hike the Himalayas. To learn, I look online. Because the classroom isn't enough for me. Not when I can see faces, hear voices, and chat with people on the other side of the world. I want to learn about Chinese history from someone in Beijing. My school has to keep up with me not the other way around. I have more and more choices. When you were my age, no one had heard of a charter school. No one could imagine a virtual school. But it's projected that by 2019, half of all high school courses will take place online. I use mobile devices to connect with friends, classmates, and teachers. And when I'm more connected, I'm more interested. I don't buy music at a store or movies or books. I get them instantly online. And when they excite me, I share with friends. That's how I want my education to be. I need a degree even more than my parents. I know it, and so do my friends. But will I be prepared? Public grade schools are under huge budget pressures, and traditional college is increasingly unaffordable. I don't want crushing debt. If I can Google the best choice for cool shoes, rest assured I'll find the best choice of education, like two-year institutions and online courses where students like me have grown to be six million strong. And when I'm older, I want to keep learning. Do you recognize me? Very soon, I will be changing the world. But I need you. If you're ready to help me, I'll find you. But it's your challenge to keep up with me. I'm a digital native, an active learner. Listen to me, help me. Together, we can create the future. Technology's great, but what I see is often we put the cart before the horse. Schools buy all this technology, and then the expectation is on all of you to effectively implement that technology. But make no mistake about it, if the instructional design is not solid, the technology is just going to increase the rate of failure. You want that technology to actually get better results for your kids. So how do we work on our instructional design? Our golden rule, when we started rolling out all these initiatives back in 2009, was we focused on the foundation first, with our teachers, with our students, pedagogy first, technology second, if appropriate. If you were a great teacher, we were not going to ram technology down your throats and expect this great transformation to happen because technology is not gonna transform anything. It's how all of you effectively use technology to empower kids, to learn, to become better. That's truly going to transform teaching and learning. But when we think about that foundation, that pedagogy first, remember this. Pedagogy is the driver, technology is the accelerator. Focus on what you do best. 
Focus on how you've been trained to reach kids. Provide them feedback. Work on that pedagogy. Have those sound learning outcomes. Develop your lessons and your activities. Have your assessments for formative and summative feedback. And then the last thing you want to do is pick that tool. And even that, we need to rethink that as well. But always think about that pedagogy first. We had, to complete, complete, look, we had to create this common vision because we were all over the place. And what vision had to focus on, what do we want our kids to do? What were those higher order thinking skills that were found in our higher standards that you were accountable for addressing? So we looked at the knowledge taxonomy embedded here in the rigor relevance framework, and we looked at what, are our kids, what do we want our kids to be able to do? And how are they applying their learning across all disciplines to apply, to solve, to real world predictable problems, and also how could they apply to solve real-world unpredictable problems. And we were focusing on how are our teachers and kids creating products to demonstrate conceptual mastery that fell in this quad D. Do the students have the competence to think more deeply, to think more critically in complex ways? Because when you're residing in quad D, you're preparing kids for this unknown world. You're preparing kids for those jobs that don't exist, that you don't, don't exist yet, because you're preparing them to think. And when you think about focusing on the basics first, the technology piece becomes pretty simple. And there's so, and don't worry, all these are in my handout. There are so many different products that kids can create. Digital storytelling, mashing, podcasting, videos. They can network. But ultimately, how do we know our kids are learning? And I want you to think about every time that you integrate technology or you're asked to integrate technology, you should know how is this impacting learning. Because when I go into schools and I talk to leaders a lot and I ask them, well, how do you know all this money you're spending on technology is impacting learning? I get blank stares. Always ensure that that pedagogy is in place and that you actually, when you're integrating that technology, that it's having an impact because it does come down to results. Not in terms of achievement, but learning. And if kids are learning, they ultimately will achieve. And do not fall for the engagement trap. You will hear many, many claims about how technology will increase student engagement. It will trans, it's not gonna transform anything. Engagement does not always equate to learning. Look past the bells and whistles, the smoke and mirrors, and yes, you want kids engaged? But more importantly, you want to make sure that that engagement when you're integrating a technology is actually resulting in enhanced learning. And then when you get to focusing on that pedagogy and you're developing these sound lessons, the fun part is not for you to pick the tool, but let your kids choose the right tool for the right task. It's not about you learning all these tools. It's not. It's about can you assess what kids have learned when they create those artifacts with the technology. And that's what you're trained to do. So don't feel all the pressure to learn all these tools. It's not about that. Can you assess what students have learned when they've created that product with the tool? And the real change, when it comes to technology, the real change comes from you modeling those new expectations, showing your colleagues how technology can empower kids in different ways because you are the true leaders in our schools. Second big shift is think about how mobile is just overtaking not just the lives of our kids, but our lives as adults. By 2020, the mobile device will be the primary connection tool for humans across the world to connect to the internet. And mobile is not just transforming education, it's impacting all of you. Devices have changed how we perceive comp computing. It's more personal, it's more accessible. Everything is gamified. How many people play Trivia Crack? Yeah, it's called Trivia Crack for a reason. Everything is gamified, we get our badges, we get awards. And think about all these other tools. If you've never heard of them, Kahoot is an amazing tool. Complete gamified digital pedagogy. It's amazing. Also, real-time feedback. What about truncated communication? Our students can't write. They have horrible grammar because they're texting, they're on Twitter. Are we teaching that in our schools? We started teaching it. That's why we started integrating texting and Twitter in our English classes to teach our kids how to write better in 140 characters. But most importantly, the mobile 
brings this hands-on learning aspect. And there's so many benefits to mobile technology, whether it be engagement, increased studying, the portability, all these different things that mobile enhances. And when you think about kids and how kids view their mobile devices, two-thirds of learners are already on smartphones, even in our poorest districts. Mobile devices provide flexibility that's never been seen before. Learning can take place anytime, anywhere. And it really caters to those kids that are more on the move. But the mobile aspect, you gotta have those outcomes in place. Pedagogy first. And when you think about pedagogy, mobile provides a natural pedagogical fit. Mobile devices can be integrated as part of anticipatory sets, checking for understanding, assessment, closure, even homework reminders. It's not about reinventing the wheel. It's about finding that seamless connection to what you already do. Don't worry, all these are in my handout. I hate a lot of text on slides, but I just want to give you an idea of all the amazing things that your kids can be doing in your class, in your school, with mobile technology. So many interesting things. And this is just a short list of what they can do. We were the first school in New Jersey to go bring your own device over five and a half years ago. When people told us it was a dumb idea and that it wasn't going to increase achievement. Well, over our five-year transformation, we increased every metric we were judged on as a school. We gave up that control, we trusted kids, and we focused on our initiative. What did we want the mobile to do? Enhance support learning, increase personal productivity, conduct better research, help our kids become more digitally literate, and teach our kids about being responsible with their technology. Because it wasn't happening outside of school. Going mobile raised the bar because our kids had access to the internet. And access to the internet levels the playing field, but you know what else it does? It prohibited our teachers from asking questions, wrote level questions that our kids could Google the answers to. It raised the bar because in the long term, it forced us to start asking better questions. When you think about devices and you think about technology, devices technology should never drive instruction. The role of technology and the role of devices is to support and enhance what kids should already be doing at a deeper, more applicable, and relevant level. Third shift, and this is one of the ones I love talking about because this had so many impacts and it was so simple to do. Think about school. And I asked you, would you want to be a child in your own student's classroom? Think about when you go into school. What do you see? The exact opposite of the real world. Now, if there were 10 lazy boys up here, with built-in massagers, some of you would have gotten here early and you would have staked out your claim and you would not move. You might not move all day. <laughs> Why? Because you expect and you deserve and you want comfort. Why don't we give that to our kids? Because you know what? The research has even found that classroom design does impact learning. So what do our, if this is the case, why aren't we focusing on a redesign? of the structure and function of our schools. And we gotta look at furniture, the layout, colors, temperature, acoustics, lighting. What do our classrooms and our buildings look like? I want you to think about what changes would you like to make to your own classrooms when you get back to your schools? Because here's some inspiration for you. Here's what some public schools are doing across the country with limited resources. They're not buying money on the traditional desks and furniture. They're getting more creative whether it be the colors, kids being allowed to use their devices, more collaborative seating. Look at this. You ever sit in your own child's classroom at parent-teacher conferences and get up and you can't even feel your back anymore because of a hard plastic chair? You could buy a lot of these workout balls for a fraction of the price. It's giving out that control and becoming a little more innovative and creative about how we use space. And there's so much inspiration because the internet provides us all this inspiration and these ideas that are being implemented in schools. And if you want to see a school district that's doing it across an entire county, check out Albemarle County in Virginia. The superintendent, Pam Moran, great vision. This is the expectation across all schools, all classrooms. Now look at this building. Yeah, it looks brand new. The traditional high school is to the left. 
I want you to picture this. The bottom floor, when people said it can't be done, the bottom floor is all leased out to local businesses. Now I'm gonna show you what floors two and three look like for those kids. Look at the colors, look at the furniture, look at the possibilities. And when you think about possibilities, look at kids, rocking chairs, ottomans, empowered to use their tools. A much more reflective and reminiscent environment of the real world. Now I'm gonna show you my school. Not as fancy as this, because we had no money, by the way. But our kids did have ubiquitous access to the Wi-Fi. They could come in and get connected to the internet anytime they wanted using the same username and password they always used. We had school branded charging stations in all common areas. Look, our kids left devices unattended. And by every charging station was a Keurig. Our kids could get coffee and Wi-Fi anytime they wanted. Why? Because we expect coffee and Wi-Fi. Now, if you got younger kids, Younger kids, you can have hot chocolate, maybe sugar-free. And you want to know what else we did? <laughs> Our home economics courses, baked food, and had it for sale for donations, which they then used in their classes to fund their projects. We connected everything. We also put thinking games, chess. You want to know what that did? That got our teachers to stop going to the faculty room, which is a little bit toxic, and they started actually going and having conversations during their lunch in our common spaces over chess with our kids. And you know what that did? It built relationships. When you build relationships with kids, your work becomes exponentially easier for all of you. Oh, and by the way, we didn't do lazy boys. We did leather couches. We took over our unclaimed room, removed the door, and we put five leather couches where our kids could go and take naps anytime they wanted. During their lunch, their time, why? More about them, less about us. Have you ever thought the school library was boring? We'll talk to the kids at a New Jersey high school. CBS 2's Cindy Shu takes us to New Milford to find out what all the buzz is all about. Welcome to the library at New Milford High School, where there's a lot more than books. This is the brand new maker space, and we do mean make. Kyle Henry is using a 3D printer to make a phone case. He designed it on the computer, then printed out. He made this black one the other day. You could change your color. You have blue, black, white, red, green, and basically comes out of phone case in an hour or two. Other students are creating video game controllers out of anything, even fruit. Tristan Tiangson, let me play along. I never played a video game with fruit. It's, it's very, uh, it's a very interesting game. <laughs> I think we broke it. <laughs> Students can visit the makerspace anytime they want. Pamela Yashu built her own computer last month and loves taking them apart in the take apart station. This is a motherboard, everything connects to this. Uh, this is a CPU, does calculations for the computer. This is a heat sink which cools off the CPU. And the list goes on. The makerspace was created this school year by Laura Fleming, who runs the library, and says it's all about making learning fun and inspiring innovation. I've had kids go home and learn about things that they started in our makerspace. And to me, that's, that's you know, a teacher's dream. And it has students dreaming big. Now I want to do biomedical engineering, so hopefully I'll get into that. And Makerspace has helped you feel that way? Yeah, it has a lot. It shows us all the different ways to build things, and it takes you through step by step. While the students love the Makerspace, next year it's going to look completely different. They want to keep changing it up to keep it new and relevant. In New Milford, New Jersey, Cindy Shu, CBS 2 News. Mm, and as far as cost, Fleming says you can create a Makerspace on any budget. Cost her school about $1,500, and she saved money by getting many of those things are donated but that is just I mean stimulating young minds probably the best decision we ever made and I will tell you every year our family and consumer sciences came down and work with Laura in the makerspace on a molecular gastronomy activity where they looked at the impact of cooking on the chemical and physical properties of food we connected this to every single content area this was a juggernaut of a K-12 solution where kids were able to create, invent, tinker, make to learn, where they came and found value. We had special education students that were building working computers from the parts we were throwing out out of cardboard boxes. If you do not have a makerspace in your school, I'm telling you right now, this will transform the environment in your school. And there's more information in my handout. All right, personalized, individualized, differentiated, blended learning, virtual learning, why is it important? Personalization is about moving from the what to the who. Who is learning about? 
Learning is about each individual kid. If we want to personalize it, it's focusing on their diverse interests, their needs to truly emphasize an ownership of learning. This refined focus on personalization is about knowledge and how it's used. Authentic, authentic relevant, real-world context builds on the diverse strengths and needs of all of our kids, fosters independence, promotes an ownership of learning, different ways to facilitate learning, and most importantly, well not most importantly, but since we're here talking about tech, how do we use tech to support and enhance that learning experience for our kids? And when you look at different ways to personalization, there's technology enabled, but we don't want that. Think about the blended experience where kids, we can get that real-time feedback, data-driven planning, rotational environments as we move from technology-enabled, blended to mastery-based, where it's student-directed learning, mastery-driven assessment, predictive analytics. And when you look at all the impacts of a blended learning experience for your kids, it's not just about the technology. The technology helps to reach that higher goal, that more purpose. Global connections, game-based learning, direct instruction, peer-to-peer -peer coaching, focusing on mastery, virtual learning platforms. Why not? I guess he really means it, though. Yeah. All right. Well, across the country, teachers are turning the education process upside down. It's a new teaching trend where lessons are taught at home. And students complete their homework at school. CBS 2 Cindy Shu reports on how some New Jersey educators are flipping classrooms. Welcome to Pre-Calculus at New Milford High School, where they flipped the class. That means all that homework that used to be done at home is now done in class with the teacher. And at home, students watch a 5 to 10 minute video designed by the teacher about what will be taught the next day. Students tell me they love it. I used to spend hours on homework. Like, I would have textbooks, notebooks, like, it was like ridiculous. But. With the flipped class, students say homework at home is now done in under an hour. And class time is where they actually get to work with teachers to get their questions answered. When I get into class, like, I understand it so much better because, like, I'm working and she's always there to, like, when I have questions, whereas at home, I couldn't have those questions answered for me. Teacher Kanchan Chalani says students are loving this high-tech approach. They get to use their phones, they get to use their computers, um, they get to work with each other. You know, I don't want silence in the classroom. Just the interactiveness in class, more kids are engaged in doing their work as opposed to if I was just teaching them. You know, you get kids that look out the window, you get kids that daydream. And the videos use the teacher's voice and creativity, and students are able to text or email questions while they're watching the videos at home. Now, it's up to each teacher whether they want to flip their classrooms, and so far at this school, about 10% of the teachers are doing it consistently. About 30% are trying it out here and there. While flipping the class is relatively new, many here say it's likely the wave of the future. In New Milford, New Jersey, Cindy Shu, CBS2 News. Now, teachers also say that with flipped classes, students can also work ahead and get extra help so everyone can learn at their own pace. This is a genius idea. Interesting, in right? I love it. Because, yeah. you know, nowadays they teach different math methods. And so when your children come home, you don't know, you, what they're talking you know how about. to solve the problem, but in a totally different way. Right. So I love this it idea. Takes us out of the homework. <laughs> That's the whole idea. So when you think about me better meeting the needs and learning at their pace, and when we flipped in our school, we didn't do it all the time. We did it when it was appropriate, based on the concept that we were teaching or the unit we were working on. And it really flips the script for our kids. And we, provide front, we front loaded some of that content at home. And by the way, not all of our kids had devices at home. We solved, we came up with solutions instead of excuses. We signed out Chromebooks like library books. We added Wi-Fi across our school. We told our kids where Wi-Fi was at home, we meet in town. But we focused on really emphasizing those diverse needs of our kids. And it's still the same goals were at hand. We wanted kids to create, evaluate, analyze, but we wanted them to really be working with the teacher in a more of a facilitator role in our school so we could better help meet the needs of the kids that were the high flyers and the ones that needed more help. And then we thought, started thinking about how could we really meet the needs of those kids that want other learning experiences, that can glean knowledge from virtual experiences. Well, high school is going super high tech with 3D virtual classrooms. CBS 2's Cindy Shu takes us to New Jersey, where it's all about thinking ahead and outside the box. 
Welcome to New Milford High School, where the students are learning chemistry in a whole new way. First of all, everyone with a headset on can communicate with other students throughout the school. This is my headset where I can also talk to different people, so they don't have to be necessarily right next to me for, for me to hear them. Each student also creates their own avatar. This is Angie Belenich's avatar. The real Angie showed us how she can change it up anytime she wants. And they can change the hair color and the hairstyle. And there are lots of clothing options as well. The students' avatars visit all sorts of virtual classrooms on the computer. It's part of a pilot program exploring the possibilities of virtual learning by breaking down the barriers of a traditional classroom. It's really cool because we can communicate possibly with people across the world. These whiteboards are called media boards, where students from different classes post anything they want, from YouTube videos to questions, to help each other understand chemistry problems. Sometimes people learn differently. So so one way I explain something can be more helpful to someone than uh, what the teacher says. So while it's a lot of students helping students, science teacher Vicki Smith loves it as well. Here's her avatar, checking out how her students are doing. I can actually monitor each student without having to be by them and see what they're doing. How is their learning progressing? Smith says teachers need to think out of the box to keep up with how kids are learning these days. In New Milford, New Jersey, Cindy Shu, CBS2 News. We created our own virtual learning environment with the assistance of a, a company that we partnered with to provide better experiences for our kids. And there's so many benefits of virtual learning that there's no time or space restrictions. They're flexible to cater to individuals, greater responsibility on the behalf of the student, expanding their horizons and interest-based. What we did at our school, we added virtual high school, added 230 new courses to our uh, course catalog. For K-12 schools, there's Edusier. This did cost us money. This was the only, one of the only things that did cost us money. But we looked at all the different ways we could better meet the needs of our kids. And we also looked at how could we incorporate these free, self-paced learning platforms that are out there? How could we tap into that knowledge that's, being, that's flooding the internet? And we looked at OpenCourseWare. If you don't know what OpenCourseWare is, the actual courses offered from Harvard, Yale, MIT, Stanford, from the same professors that's online, any of you can take. So what did we do? We took our independent study concept that was on the books, and we created an independent OpenCourseWare study where our kids started taking those courses from MIT, Harvard, Stanford. You'll see the project in my handout, but once the kids took that course on their own time and they showed us the new skills, what they had learned, we gave them honors credit on their transcripts. We had kids take a course from MIT on Python and they learned how to code their own games and create their own games without any direct instruction from a teacher. And the last big shift that we had to do, hardest thing we had to do, was focus on learning, not grades. We looked hard at our school, and we've said we were failing too many kids, grades were punitive, we wanted to be more focused on have our kids learned. We created a seven-step criteria as a school. Seven criteria had to be met before a kid failed a class. I reviewed every failing grade and demanded that I saw that evidence for the benefit of our kids. Not only did we reduce our failures by 75%, all of our achievements still went up. We focused more on what was going on in our classrooms, was learning taking place, no matter at what level. And we focused on meeting the needs of our kids. And what did we do? Ultimately, we created this free range learning environment for our kids, an environment that they found value in, that they appreciated. And we looked at how we learn as adults, because knowledge does empower you. And when you think about the internet today, and you think about social media, it gets a bad rap. But we can no longer afford and accept disconnected nomads in our profession because there's a world of information out there. And it's okay, I started off as a creepy lurker too. You can lurk and learn. It's about increasing access, participating. All the things that you're doing in your classrooms, other people are doing as well. Why would you want to reinvent the wheel? No more isolated islands, no more silos of information. Connect with the same people. You're gonna learn so much at this event. You're going to make these face-to-face -face connections, but what happens when you get back to your homes, to your schools? This learning can keep, take, look, can keep, I'm running out of time, I'm now stuttering. This learning can take place through tools anytime, anywhere, with anyone you want. You can be at the center of your learning 24-7, following the people that you want, getting the resources, acquiring knowledge, and when you do, your network expands. The smartest person in the room is the room. And imagine that room is your entire state, 
you're the entire country, the entire world that is always working for you behind the scenes. And ultimately, those connections will provide you with resources, knowledge, ideas, strategies, support, inspiration, specifically related to the work that you do in family and consumer science. That's why it works. That's why it's powerful. And transformation at scale will never occur if we just celebrate our isolated pockets of excellence. We, all kids deserve excellence, not in one classroom, not in one school, across entire districts, across our entire country. But it starts with all of you. And remember, technology will not transform education. You will. Oh, yeah, I got like a minute left. Tr technology will not transform education. Those of you that use it effectively will. All of you do work that matters. You're impacting the lives of kids each and every day. Think about how you can continue to push that envelope to create classrooms and schools that work better for your kids. And stealing a quote from Gandhi, be the change that you wish to see. Others might not change, but you have a choice. You can start doing things differently, better, and have that positive impact on your kids and your actions will persuade others. And ultimately, with all this new stuff, sometimes we are a little reluctant. I know, we're a little reluctant when we try something new for the first time. I'll be fine. Have fun. I'll do it. Well. Here goes something, I guess. Okay, you can do this. I'm gonna, I'm gonna jump. You got it. Whoa, my ski's slipping off. Just remember, never snowplow, okay? No snow flows. Keep it straight and you'll be fine. Okay. Same thing you do on the 20. Straight. Do you go faster on the in run? A little bit. A little bit? Yeah. Is it any steeper, do you think? Not same, much. Same steepness, it's just longer. Well, just longer. Just longer. Just a bigger 20, that's all. Yep. Have it's fun. a bigger 20. Go ahead. You got this. <laughs> I got it. It's fine. You'll, you'll be fine. Okay. Here. The longer you wait, you'll be more scared. I go. the first time freaks you out. That's the only thing, it's so fun! Huh? 60 seems like nothing now. Whoa! The person that says it can be done should not interrupt the person that's doing it. That can be you going down that slope. And think about it, when you find success and you see the impact, imagine what that's gonna do for your kids. You're, you're making a difference in education. I applaud the admirable work that you do. There's nothing more noble in this country than being a teacher. Keep impacting the lives of kids and keep making a difference. Oh, shameless plug time. I will be outside signing books at like 10.30. Um, a lot of things that I talked about, we talked from a practical standpoint of how we initiated sustainable change at our school. So if you're interested in more, I'll be out there doing that. Now, my next slide is the digital handout. If, if the tech people in the back could just keep it up for just a couple seconds, because we can keep moving, I'll leave it up. But this way you can scan it. There's a few quick survey questions, very quick. It goes back to my employer. There it is. The link down at the bottom is case sensitive. You could scan a code, write the link down. Thank you very much, everybody. Have a great rest of the conference.